Hey there everybody, Joe here. Thanks for tuning in again. I'm finally finished with that outer space scene if you've been following along in previous videos. That took a while and it feels good to be finished and thank you for all of the compliments and encouragement along the way. Well, I'm going to put it up for sale on eBay. It's an 8x4 acrylic on canvas, so if you have any interest in that painting, you can go to the link below in the description and check that out on eBay. So it's time to start a new project. And I've always wanted to do a good fire-breathing dragon. So when I was a kid, you know, I'd, I loved drawing monsters. I'd, I would study animals and then combine different, different features to you know, make my own creatures. And uh, a lot of the times they were just big toothy monsters. I, I don't know why I loved that so much. But uh, I would do that in, in church a lot of the time. You know, I'd be bored in a church service drawing monsters on the little bulletin they hand out. One of my favorite fire-breathing dragon descriptions happens to be in the book of Job that is in the Bible, one of the books in the Bible. As far as I know, one of the oldest books around. I will not fail to speak of Leviathan's limbs, its strength and its graceful form. Who can strip off its outer coat? Who can penetrate its double coat of armor? Who dares open the doors of its mouth, ringed about with fearsome teeth? Its back has rows of shields tightly sealed together. Each is so close to the next that no air can pass between. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Its snorting throws out flashes of light. Its eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flames stream from its mouth. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke pours from its nostrils as from a boiling pot over burning reeds. Its breath sets coals ablaze, and flames dart from its mouth. Strength resides in its neck. Dismay goes before it. The folds of its flesh are tightly joined. They are firm and immovable. Its chest is hard as rock hard as a lower millstone. When it rises up, the mighty are terrified. They retreat before its thrashing. The sword that reaches it has no effect, nor does the spear or the dart or the javelin. Iron it treats like straw, the bronze like rotten wood. Arrows do not make it flee. Sling stones are like chaff to it. A club seems to it but a piece of straw. It laughs at the rattling of the lance. Its undersides are jagged potsherds, leaving a trail in the mud like a threshing sledge. It makes the depths churn like a boiling cauldron and stirs up the sea like a pot of ointment. It leaves a glistening wake behind it. One would think the deep had white hair. Nothing on earth is its equal, a creature without fear. So that's the description. And there's a lot of things in there like the comparison of its underbelly to a threshing sledge is, is a real good visual description I, I think of. You know, an old threshing sledge has these bladed rocks that are embedded in a flat piece of wood that cuts into the ground when you drag it along in the process of harvesting wheat. And, and so it's similar to on a, like an alligator or a, a reptile that has scales, you know, that have a sharp protrusion coming off of each little segment. And I imagine something like that. A threshing sledge it seems like a real good anatomical description. And then the saying that the plates on its back are tightly uh, sealed together so the air can't pass between. I'm going to use this and see if I can uh, research a little bit, make the most sense of it that, that I can and come up with a, a good representation of what might have been the Leviathan. Uh, I just think it's a, a really cool concept for a picture. I'm going to model my drawing after the plesiosaur because it starts right out saying that it has you know it talks about its limbs I will not fail to speak of Leviathan's limbs its strength and its graceful form uh, yet it doesn't talk about any details of those limbs no no uh, fingers toes claws elbows it's just limbs so I think well it makes sense then that it, that it might be the big paddles that you see on sea creatures strength resides in its neck, it says. Why would you speak of a neck unless it was really something to be spoken of about the creature? So I think the long neck fits. And it says it has a hard chest. I noticed that the skeletons of these, these uh, creatures have a really unique thing where they have a lot of bone, a, the flat bone like a shoulder blade that looks like a fixed joint in the middle. 
and I imagine that making a very hard chest, and, and then they have these, uh, these gastral bone, gastro, I, I forget what you call them, the bones that go across the belly, and it says its underbelly has all of these sharp protrusions like, like a threshing sledge, and so here uh, on those skeletons you can see that there's a hard and bony underbelly. So to me this really fits the description, and so you know, just for the thrill, I'm going to use that anatomy and then try to, try to turn it into this fire-breathing beast that's in this passage. It's nice to do things with pencil first. It allows me to think more quickly, be creative, and then, you know, rearrange things on a small scale. It, it is wise to do some kind of rendering or practice before I get going with paint. Sometimes, you know, I'll just start throwing paint on because whatever... I end up with, I'll be okay with. But this, I really want this to be dialed in. I want the perspective to be, you know, just j just how I want it. You know, I'll, I'll uh, do the rendering with the pencil first. All right, looking at comments from the flowers video. I want to say thank you to Jessica Ede and Susanna Collins both. Thank you for giving me such a nice compliment on the explanations. I approach things as a researcher, and, and if I can't make an experiment with my own work that shows me using something that I'm claiming is true, then I don't take anybody's word for it. You know, I don't care who says that something is this way. If I can't see it working with my experiment, I think that that's, that's the, way, the same way I approach this project I'm going to do with this fire-breathing dragon. You know, I don't, I don't care how much people believe that history is one way or another. You know, if a story seems believable to me, then I'm going to make my own decision about it. And so all of my work is based on my experiments so that I can stand behind it. It's really encouraging to hear you say that. You know, I like, I like to hear that. Hey, all right, Tyler Royal says, I'm so grateful for your videos. Your videos have just helped me paint my uh, A-level art exam, and I feel great. Well, thank you for that. Encouraging report, Tyler. Thanks for the kiss from Brazil, Tina. Hannah uh, Sidek, Sidek, Sidek says, Hi, can I paint small mural with artistic acrylic paints? Are they durable enough? I, I think they are. I, and uh, someone pointed out uh, this same conversation earlier uh, that there are tubes that are specifically made to, to handle UV light more than others. And, I don't think I would trust them on exterior application, but interior, yeah, I definitely would. I think any acrylic tubes are fine for interior. I just use the cans because they're cheap. The tubes probably are nicer looking in the end because some of the time, some of the tubes have a higher ratio of pigment and I think that they shrink less and preserve the brush texture. Linda Shears. You forgot your 10 feet to your 40 feet in size of large flowers. You disappoint me, sorry. Okay, well, <laughs> that's okay. I understand. I disappoint myself sometimes. I got into a lot of math on, on this project. You know, if you didn't watch that video, it's worth watching. That's, that's been a really helpful tool for me, the rule of halves and doubles. And I talk about how the distance changes on the ground as you look out, how to approximate the uh, amount of distance you're looking at in, in a given space on the ground so that you can keep your perspective consistent. It's a helpful rule. Uh, it's changed the way I paint forever. I always use it in every painting now. Hey, here we go. The art worker says, it's always good to see you working with halves and doubles. Keeping this in mind helps me a lot more to understand how distance works and allows me to keep me on track in my paintings. YouTube needs your uploads, buddy. Hey, thanks for that nice encouragement. That's very, very kind of you to say that. That uh, rule of halves and doubles, I just, you know, I, I got real curious if there was a mathematical way to test the perspective in a picture rather than always guessing. And I was, you know, I was looking in a mirror at how things changed and started drawing triangles sideways on paper. And, you know, once I mapped it out, it's a pretty simple principle. It's not real advanced math at all. Uh, you know, just, just a, a pattern that I noticed. Michael Kent says, just wondering when we will see the finished Harry Potter painting. Been eagerly watching for some time. Well, thank you, Michael. That's really nice. The thing is, is that's really hard. That painting has just, you know, been like the hardest thing I ever tried to do. 
I'm going to show it to you right now. I'm trying to paint, for those of you that, that maybe didn't see it, I'm trying to paint Harry Potter and I just thought, you know what, I want to figure out exactly what makes people look the way they do because I don't believe it's a million tiny details. I don't think that at all. I think there's certain key components that cause you to be able to recognize somebody quickly even from a distance where all you see is a blurry face. And I want to be able to, to immediately get those and get the likeness of somebody without even looking at a photo just by memorizing like one memorizes a list and use that. So I've been trying that method and it's hard. So look, here's the painting so far. So I noticed a lot of things in the face. You know, the edges of the mouth were a real sticking point. So I learned some new stuff about, you know, the way the edges of the mouth are put together. And then the height of the nostrils, I noticed that's a real issue for expression, being, being careful. I'm tilting the head down, so, you know, I have to get the height of the nostrils right in comparison with the eyes and the mouth. And then I had the forehead shadowed kind of weird. And it still looks weird to me. I got to do a bunch of, uh, of little adjustments probably. Or maybe there's one obvious thing I'm missing. I had to just pull the, the camera off, you know, because, you know, even I get to the point where I, I, just, I, I just have to have nothing around and just be able to think about it. And the camera does sometimes make it hard for me to think through problem solving. I'm working on that and, and when I do, I'm definitely going to share what I think the, the key components were to getting it to, to look right. Thanks, Ammo. I'm a huge fan and I consider you the Michael Jackson of painting. <laughs> you can just call me MJ. Thank you for sharing this, Bonnie. M. The math made all the difference to me. Thank you. Jay Sullivan, thank you for the compliment on the mountain. Uh, Seema uh, Abedini also loved the mountain. Thank you very much for compliments on that. And, and you know, that was just, I just threw that in real quick and I was really happy with Sometimes you get lucky and it comes out good. Uh, but you can see a lot more about painting mountains. I, I do use a very specific method if you're interested in that. And you can look at any of my videos that are titled Landscape. The mountain painting portions in there, I, I really try to explain my strategy in the same kind of detail there. Walking on Sunshine says, I have been in uh, years of art lessons, but my teachers have never taught me that. I really enjoy the white plus yellow to shadow snippet lesson. Okay, so talking about how the color changes as an object brightens, it moves toward yellow. Yeah, uh, I never heard any teachers explain that either. And uh, that's, that's not something to be upset at anybody for. It's just, I, I think that it's just new information. I'm, I'm not trying to take credit saying I'm the one that discovered this. It's just that I didn't know until I noticed it and, and started using it. I wasn't able to find it in books. Uh, I'm going to call it the rule of shifting hues. I, I think that's a good name for it. Zolfi Carr says, Joe, I'm addicted to your videos. Please post more. Hey, all right. I like to hear that. <laughs> Thanks. All right, I'm going to stop there. Thanks again for watching. And I look forward to diving into to that Leviathan painting next time. So we'll see you then.